Welcome back to Patrick's Review. In this episode, Britannic, a telepic that came out in the year 2000. Hi there, welcome back to Patrick's Review. I'm your host, Mila Sipka, and join me as I take you on a ride through the wild world of science fiction action horror, all from my personal DVD collection of 1200 DVDs, plus Blu rays, a few Blu rays, VHS tapes, video games, and TV shows. You know, in a few episodes, time I'll actually do a video game. <laughs> anyway, in this episode, and I'm in case you're wondering, why, um, I, only a couple hours ago I actually did the third part of the D Spectrum 4, in case you're wondering. <laughs> I might do another episode tonight, I don't know. I will see. Now, this episode we'll look at the film Britannic, which you just saw the cover. It is a, two, it is a telepic that came out in the US, uh, UK and USA at, on the 10th of January 2000. It was directed by Brian Trenchard Smith. And the disc comes from Flashback Entertainment. Of course, it was originally released in Peacock Films as well. Now, the, this, this uh, 2000 telepic was a fictionalized retelling of the rather mysterious circumstances of the sinking of the HMAS Britannic, at its time the largest ocean liner afloat. There have been some discussions over the years as to what caused the ship to sink. Although today we have to settle with the fact that the ship was most likely torpedoed by a German U-boat that was in the area, or a sea mine, and that the sinking was exacerbated by the stocks of coal that were in the ship's fuel load. I'll explain more about that soon enough. And caused the ship to sink with only 30 deaths compared to its sister ship, the Titanic, which lost something like 1,500 people or so. Now the setting is World War I, and the HMAS Britannic has been used as a hospital ship. The Germans believe that the ship is smuggling cargoes of weaponry to the British military. Of course it is World War I. <laughs> and have assigned a spy posing as a priest to confirm this, in if necessary to either overtake or sink the ship. He has allies in the mostly Irish coal circus who are members of the Irish Republican movement, and who have their own plans to commandeer the ship. Vera Campbell, a survivor of the Titanic, who lost her husband in that tra tragedy, who is now working for British intelligence, has been sent undercover as governess to board the Britannic and flush out the German spy before things get out of hand. But she starts to fall, of course initially she's treated kind of badly by the captain and the staff because they don't think, <laughs> first of all they don't think that uh, she's capable of doing a job and secondly uh, what's the whole point of getting a spy in the hospital ship? <laughs> but anyway, as she starts to fall in love with the priest Reynolds who is the German spy, she's torn between her duties and Reynolds who for his part realizes that his cause isn't right but still needs to complete his mission. Doesn't have much of a choice. Meanwhile, a German U-boat trailing the ship is given orders to sink the target as a last resort, in case the operatives don't succeed. I told you. If you're looking for an authentic account of the hows and whys of what caused the Britannic to sink, then you can pretty much forget it. Much of the story here is complete bullshit. The only reason they made this film was to cash in the success of James Cameron's epic blockbuster Titanic from 1997, it even follows much of that film's central relationship with pretty much the same beats, except that in this case, it is not a relationship between a rich passenger and a poor passenger, but a relationship between two spies on opposing sides during a wartime situation. There is a lot of stuff here that doesn't make any real sense in a real world setting, so I'm going to have to set the record straight with all the plot holes and mistakes here. Logic control, here are the facts. <clears throat> during the captain's debriefing, by the way, the captain was played by uh, uh, John Reese Davis. <laughs> Great guy. <laughs> During the captain's debriefing to his crew, he mentions. Oh, no, hang on. Uh, John Reese Davis, yeah, that's right. You know, the guy who's been Lord of the Rings and in, in the Rays of the Lost Ark and Neon Jones. <laughs> anyway. Now, the, during the captain's debriefing to his crew, he mentions that they're bound for the island of Modros to pick up wounded soldiers. Modros is the name of the town on the island of Lemnos in Greece. The Britannic did not sink at early morning before sunrise as depicted in the film, but actually at 8 in the morning. There were no civilian passengers on the ship except for military medical personnel and wounded soldiers. The 30 or so deaths that occurred were when two lifeboats were launched before the orders to stop the propellers were given, and both lifeboats were sucked into the propellers and smashed up. After the orders were given, the propellers stopped. In the movie, the orders were not given, and the propellers stayed on. The captain's name was in real life was Bart Lett, not Barrett. The Britannic actually departed at 2 o'clock in the afternoon instead of at night. When the Irish mutineers launched their assault, they claim it as revenge for the black and tans, something that didn't happen until after the war ended. 
In real life, the explosion that caused the sinking of the Britannic occurred on the starboard side, the ship's right-hand side, not the port side. And while we are on that matter, it was only one explosion that sunk the real Britannic, not two. Oh, and there was no HMAS to Victoria in the British fleet during World War I. The last ship bearing that name sunk in the Mediterranean in 1893. The way the Britannic sinks to the bottom of the sea is also inaccurate. It was so big, and by the way, it was a sister ship to the Titanic, and was even bigger than Titanic, and even designed to be more robust after, after what happened with the Titanic. It was so big that the bow hit the bottom while the stern was still above water. Captain Bartlett also didn't leave the ship until the water hit the bridge and actually swam to a lifeboat instead of departing early like in the movie. In real life, the doomed lifeboats were smashed up by the port propeller, that's the left-hand side propeller, not the starboard side one. Now, to assist the film's defense, the reason why the propellers are still turning up the explosion is because the steam engines that the ship used don't break so easily, and plus there were some redundant engines as well, so they were still working even after the explosion hit. And for the dreams that Vera has of her watching Titanic sinking intact instead of breaking into like in real life, it could be attributed to the fact that dreams and nightmares don't always follow real life. And the split in the Titanic wasn't noticed by everybody except for only a few survivors, due to the fact that the split actually occurred in a section that was already submerged. The truth about the split of the Titanic wasn't confirmed until the wreck's discovery in 1985. It was not possible for a World War I submarine to shadow a steamer while submerged for several days because steamers are too fast for them. Last on the list is the footage of the ship's launch shown on the opening credits, which are not of the Britannic but actually of the Lusitania, another ship that was actually sunk during that war. In fact, the Lusitania's sinking caused the Americans to enter the war against Germany. Now that I've settled the facts and the technical side of things, let me tell the problems in this story, of which there are several, some sort of pretty biggie mistakes present. <laughs> the main problem was with the protagonist character Vera Campbell the survivor of the Titanic who is now a spy for British intelligence. The way she acts in the film is completely out of step with reality. Here we have a strong and capable female operative, which is nothing wrong with that, in fact, uh, but who somehow acts like she's a feminist from nearly a century in the future, like in the 1990s, and gets upset because the men around her act like they're from the 1910s. Hmm. Well, this setting is from 1916, not 1996. Male attitudes towards females are pretty rigid in those days, and most women at that time didn't have the mindset to question their perceived roles in society at that time. And the fact also remains that the character is actually pretty damn stupid as well. I mean, she engages in a relationship with a target before she, she realizes he's a German spy. I can probably excuse the fact that they get the hots for each other, but for her to sneak into his room in the middle of the night and share their clothes to jump into his bed is ridiculous for that time setting, even if he is not a spy. The fact that she believed him to be a minister was a clear lack of respect for his principles. Most men of the cloth in the 1910s would have been extremely offended to see an attractive young woman sneak into their room at night and stripping off their clothes for some nookie. Of course, they might have had some excitement at the side, but that's beside the point. Even after they reveal her true nature to each other and the German sets off the bomb that blows a hole in the ship's side, she risks her life to save them. Now, if you can excuse the fact that she might have believed he was, she was the only person who knows true identity, she still had no cause to save him. They were, after all, working for powers hostile to each other. Her mission was to kill him, not save him, regardless of their mutual feelings for each other. If she did save him, he would have been caught and later executed, and she would have been executed as well for aiding and abetting the enemy, and also their election of duty. He knew that, so that's why he sacrificed himself at the end, by pushing her off the lifeboat and letting himself get chopped up by the propellers. Also notable is that much, much earlier, the German spy and another crew member discussed the dangers of coal dust in the ship's boilers, something that wasn't discovered until decades later. I did mention I will get, explain that thing with the ship's fuel load and I'll get to it right now. Coal dust is extremely explosive, and when exposed to heat or fire, it will detonate, much like ammonium nitrate did in that uh, Beirut blast from a few days ago. By the way, my sympathies to anyone who lost their lives in that one. Oof. And... And like, like I said, cold, when it exposed heat fire, it will detonate, which you can explain why the ship sunk so fast when it did. There were rumors for years that the Britannic was carrying clandestine military cargo for the war effort, which, even if proven true, doesn't make any difference. The Britannic was a hospital ship for the British side, so even if they were carrying secret munitions, so the fuck what? They were at war against the Germans and so needed to support their own side. The only people here who broke the rules were the Germans themselves. When one of their U boats sunk the Lusitania, in real life, and forced the Americans into the war. Although the Germans did warn people beforehand not to sell on that ship, so they did act on their word. Although there was no proof of any such secret cargo. 
even after all that, if you, if you can excuse all the technical logic gaps and blatant anachronisms, Britannic the movie is still pretty much a passable romantic spy drama with a reasonably serviceable story and some good acting, never mind the out-of-place attitudes from the two leads. The visual effects are pretty poor by today's standards, but given this is from 2000, and it is a telepic, that can be forgiven somewhat. The few action scenes, when they do appear are okay, and the brief nude scene from Amanda Ryan, as a female spy, Vera Campbell, is, illogical as it is, it's still pretty daring for a 2000 telepic. On-screen sexuality didn't fully break out of the closet until a few years later, and sex scenes during this era was still fully prevented from bearing any flesh. All things considered, this is a passable telepic that most certainly won't win any awards for historical accuracy or visual effects, but does prove a de decent telepic time waster. Now for the gore. There's no gore, but the body count more than 30 if you count all the mutineers killed. Now for nudity. Amanda Ryan takes off the top of her underwear in front of a mirror, so we see profile shots of both her breasts. Like, she's in front of us, we see one side, and the mirror shows the other side. For about three seconds, that's about it on the nudity front. In fact, on the DVD, it says M, Barnes, and Brief Nudity. <laughs> now, that's it about the nudity front. Britannic gets, for me, a C+, meaning it's a passable film, basically 5 out of 10. Don't go into this expecting a history lesson, and you'll basically do fine. Now for the DVD, as you can see. <laughs> this was released on Region 4 DVD shelves by Flashback Entertainment. Actually, originally for Peacock Films, which is uh, was a label that serviced rental stores and the video stores in the you know, 2000s. They're pretty much gone now. But then re-released -re by Flashback Entertainment, one of the region's biggest dirt cheap budget labels. I got my copy as part of one of... Well, flashbacks last range of multi-packs somewhere time in the late 2000s. And the disc looks pretty decent from a technical point of view. The feature isn't 4x3 with stereo sound, but that's precisely what a telepic from 2000 should have. Telepics didn't get the widescreen ratio until well into the early the first half of the 2000s. There are no issues with the technical side of things, probably because the flashback techs got themselves a good master source and did their job well. There are no subtitles and no supplement on this disc. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I don't do requests, but if you want to know if I have a particular film in my collection, just hit me up in the comment section, and I'll answer it. Also, in case you've noticed, I've, for the past, since this year, I've done basically primers for my next episodes in the comment section, so in case you haven't figured that one out. <laughs> now, this is the second episode I've done for tonight. I might do a third tonight, maybe not, or maybe tomorrow. We'll see. Uh, guys, I hope you guys are staying safe. And just keep safe, keep wear a mask, wear gloves, keep away from this coronavirus, and you guys will do okay. That's it for this review.